So, yes, um, I've lived in a couple of places, um, but I've always done the same thing in these places. I've uh, always studied different aspects of, uh, of small angle scattering, from the analysis to the data corrections to the instrumentation. Now, about five and a half years ago, I returned to Europe. I started working for the German federal government uh, as a permanent scientist at the Federal Institute for Research and Testing. As the name suggests, this institute uh, does two things. Essentially, about 50% of the people are working on testing of materials and 50% of the people are working on research. So the testing people, they develop, um, uh, they develop ISO standards, uh, DIN standards for testing, and they test according to norms. Um, and the research people are doing materials research, but also research into very diverse uh, other topics. Uh, these include topics such as uh, biocorrosion, so um, uh, corrosion, which is accelerated by, uh, by bacteria, for example, uh, research into explosives, uh, there's also a lot of testing on explosives done, uh, and research into, um, into uh, gas canisters and how to test gas, gas canisters, whether they're still uh, capable of, um, of storing the gas safely. Um, there's a lot of materials research being done, material synthesis, including, of course, nanomaterials such as uh, the very colorful quantum dots. Besides this, there's also groups doing research on bridge monitoring. Um, there we have uh, a group, a very nice group, doing uh, research on concretes and uh, development in concrete. Uh, groups researching steels and alloys and the groups researching glass. So there's an enormous amount of, um, uh, enormous amount of research being done by an institute which isn't all that large. I and mean, this institute uh, in total uh, consists of about 1,500 uh, employees. Um, so the only way we can cover such a wide variety of uh, topics is by collaboration. And since our mandate is to uh, support the, the, the German industry and the German public, including academia, um, that uh, ties in very well. We are collaborating uh, in our group, for example, not only with the scientists at our institute, but also with many uh, institutes and universities uh, outside, um, inside and outside of Germany. And we're all, always open for more collaborations. Uh, we thrive on collaborations. I will tell a little bit more about that later. Um, because the collaborations allow us to work on, uh, on materials with very interesting structures. So what are these structures that interest me? Well, the, I'm, I'm, I'm very materials agnostic. I, I, um, I don't really care what material I measure as long as they have interesting structures in this particular size range. That means in the size range from about an angstrom or less than an angstrom to uh, several microns. Um, structures in this range uh, usually define the material properties, so they're very important for, um, for the material behavior. Um, these structures include things like uh, crystalline structures, nanoparticle structures, and uh, also uh, things like precipitates in metals. Um, Examples of these structures you will find in the second part of the lecture. Now, what I'm mostly interested in is quantifying this structure. I don't want to know, I don't just want to know what, uh, what structure there is, but I want to know how much of that structure is and what size it is. And it turns out there's not that many techniques that can do this. If you're thinking about quantifying structures in this size range, uh, one of the first uh, techniques that you um, that you will consider is that of electron microscopy. So one of the most important techniques for quantifying this structure is that of electron microscopy. Um, and this is an absolutely essential technique. Uh, this technique uh, and its high resolution variant in the hands of, a, um, of an experienced electron microscopist will allow you to get uh, an insight into the real space structure of, um, of your material. Now, 
I emphasize that you need an experienced microscopist for this because besides an image of the structure that you're seeing, you're also seeing a lot of uh, artifacts either from sample preparation or from the micros microscope itself. And this microscopist will be able to tell you which parts come from the microscope, which parts are actually uh, from your sample. But when it comes to quantifying this structure, things get a little bit harder. Um, if automated methods fail, uh, you will be left to manually count and measure all of these structural details in your sample, which can be a very, very tedious task, and it, and it introduces um, a risk of bias. Uh, recent research has shown that if you want any sort of statistics from electron microscopy, you need it to count at least 500 or even 1,000 precipitates uh, at different magnifications or um, uh, uh, structural details at, diff at different magnifications just to avoid uh, this kind of bias. So that can be very tedious. Um, and in the end, once you're finished with this, you will have quantified only a microscopic volume of material. This volume may or may not be representative for the uh, bulk of your material. So then you need to measure this in many places, um, which makes it even more um, uh, difficult. So what are the techniques that we have available that can analyze a larger amount of structure? There is something called atom probe tomography. This is uh, this has come up uh, more recently. I think uh, it's it's an ablative technique where you take a needle-shaped sample, and by uh, by stepwise ablating your sample and finding out where the atoms uh, came from that eventually land on your detector, you can build up a three-dimensional map of your of your sample. But it isn't until you hit the, uh, the X-ray scattering techniques that you can really start talking about bulk analysis. Um, the techniques of X-ray scattering come in, in three variants. They're all the same, I think. Uh, well, they're all based on the same principle. Uh, this is wide-angle X-ray scattering, small-angle X-ray scattering, and ultra-small-angle X-ray scattering. Um, these differ a little bit in the size range that you're analyzing. So, um, with the combination of this tree, you can uh, you can characterize or you can quantify the structure uh, over the size range of angstroms to microns. Beyond microns, you can use a technique such as micro X-ray computer tomography uh, to get a, a three-dimensional map of the structure inside your sample. Um, there's a second class of techniques which um, which is very similar. It's basically uh, the same principle, so scattering techniques, but with neutrons, um, with one big difference. Well, two big differences. One is the uh, the contrast that you're uh, that you're seeing. Uh, so X-ray techniques they show the contrast of the electron density of the atoms. Uh, neutrons show the contrast of the uh, of the uh, the radius of the nuclei of the atoms, and this varies a little bit differently than the electron density. Um, the second big difference with neutrons is that everything is an order of magnitude bigger. Um, the instruments are a lot bigger. They're usually uh, situated around uh, a special type of nuclear reactor, which is intended to create a lot of neutrons. Um, the instruments are not 10 meters long, but they're hundreds of meters long. The shielding is uh, usually thick blocks of concrete, um, and also the sample is an order of magnitude bigger. So where with X-ray scattering techniques, we're typically looking uh, at samples on the order of a cubic millimeter. With neutrons, you're looking at samples on the order of a cubic centimeter. So um, that means you have a few orders of magnitude more in volume that you're analyzing there. Um, but let's stick to the X-ray techniques for now. Um, Big advantages are then that we're analyzing a large amounts of material. We're getting a very good average over the structure there. Um, and it is non-destructive, of course, with an asterisk. Uh, if you shoot enough x-rays at your sample, you will change things. But in the laboratory, uh, this is typically not, uh, typically not uh, uh, a problem. Uh, but the non-destructive nature and the simple sample preparation that we can do mean that we can also do in situ experiments. And that means that we can uh, take your sample pretty much as is, stick it in the machine, and expose it to an external field. Um, and we can see how the structure 
uh, how the structure is affected by that field. Uh, what do I mean with that? Well, we can put your sample uh, in a magnetic field. Here is an example uh, with two very strong permanent magnets, um, which cause uh, um, uh, ferromagnetic particles to, to be affected by this field. We can put your sample in an electric field as well. Um, in this case, the experiment didn't work out, but there are examples where electric fields uh, have caused an effect in the sample or in the structure of the sample. We can uh, have a small tensile stage in there, so we can pull on your sample, and if you pull on your sample, something in the structure must change. Um, we can also heat up your sample. Now, this is a fairly modest heater that we've been building. Uh, it goes up to a few hundred degrees. Um, but there are small angle scattering experiments where people have uh, heated up their samples to maybe 12, 1300 degrees. Another thing we can do is we can do chemical reactions next to the instrument. So you can do a, a, a lab scale chemical reaction or, and pump a little bit of that liquid through our machine. And that means that we can observe the structural changes in the sample during the synthesis. We can collect scattering patterns with a time resolution, well, the, well with a practical time resolution of about 10 minutes. Um, so if you have a synthesis that takes uh, several hours, maybe even several days, we can nicely follow the reaction, uh, the structural changes of the reaction as it occurs. Now, this is great for slow reactions or in slow processes. Um, if you have a fast reaction, then we happily forward you to our friends at the Synchrotron. Um, I have worked at synchrotrons myself in Japan, for example. I've worked at this synchrotron. Um, however, at the moment, I would recommend uh, this beamline. It's the I-22 beamline at a diamond light source, um, which is a very good small angle, uh, the small angle scattering instrument. And the thing about synchrotrons is that they produce an enormous amount more X-ray photons there. Um, that really is the biggest difference, so they have many more photons and they can do the uh, collection of these patterns at a much higher rate so that they can follow faster processes. All right, so it's pretty nice what you can do with small angle scattering, but what is it? Well, it is essentially what it says on the tin. Um, we are um, analyzing the x-rays that are scattered to small angles. However, before I continue, a little disclaimer, um, it is a complex technique. Um, it's, uh, it's existed for about 100 years, and while it is easy to do an experiment in practice, it is very hard to do an experiment in the right way. I hope that I will be able to convey that during the rest of this part one of the talk. There are many, many special cases. Um, if not all special cases, which always require a lot of uh, a lot of time investment to really analyze what what we're seeing in our scattering pattern, and there are ambiguities. Now, ambiguity is not a word that you want to hear when it comes to uh, when it comes to an analytical technique. Um, I will explain a little bit what we mean with the ambiguities in a moment. So. Necessarily, this talk will skip out on many interesting details. Everything that I can address, um, there are always caveats uh, associated with that. It's always is a little bit more detailed than what I'm able to, to, to explain. However, I hope to be able to give you a working basic knowledge of the technique um, and maybe some interest in, um, in what the technique can do. If you have any questions about particular details, please don't hesitate to ask, um, not, just, uh, uh, not, just, not just at the end of these talks, uh, but you can also send me an email or ask any of my colleagues. Right, so what about these ambiguities? Well, um, the information that we get in small angle scattering is relatively limited. Um, however, what the researchers want to get usually is one of three parts of information. Um, you want to get information on the size and the shape of your particles, um, and maybe on the packing or the sort of superstructure, the assembly of, uh, uh, that is made by these, uh, by these structural details. However, we can uh, unambiguously only get one of these. 
That means we can get information on the size or size distribution of your, um, of your structure if you input information on the shape and the packing, for example, from techniques like electron microscopy. Um, you can get information on the shape, for example, protein shapes. Um, if you make an assumption on the size distribution, usually people assume that they have a monodisperse um, uh, 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 sample in there, that they only have one species of protein in there, um, and that they have a dilute system so that there is uh, no packing effects. And then you can get some information on the shape of these particles. And the same goes for packing. Uh, if you assume the size distribution and the shape of uh, the particles here, then you can get some information on the packing. Um, so what about the complexity? Well, you can imagine that in a hundred years um, there have been uh, uh, many people working very hard on, um, on derivations, on uh, analytical descriptions of scattering. And so you can describe pretty much all of small angle scattering with a lot of equations. And um, I myself am not particularly, um, uh, I, I can't really understand things by starting from equations. I understand things from doing, thing, uh, from doing the experiment in practice. But if you are one of these people who really like to have the, the approach from the equation side of, uh, side of things, the earlier texts that were created in the 1970s, 80s, 90s on small angle scattering, they all start with equations, uh, lots of equations. So that might be a good starting point from you. Uh, uh, for you. However, um, let me try and explain it in a more uh, graphical way. Let's uh, start at the beginning. And the beginning, I think, for the X-ray techniques really starts uh, here in Bavaria. Now, this sound I hear, uh, uh, you cannot hear the sound of this, but it's basically um, uh, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen who uh, in 1985 developed the, uh, the, the, the X-ray tube. And this was immediately patented in uh, uh, 1896, uh, in one of the fastest patents in the world, um, not, by, uh, not by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen himself, but by, uh, but by Siemens. And since then, this field has really taken off. However, we are... Um, producing x-rays now pretty much the same way as they did in the past. So you can see this, you can see this x-ray tube here. Um, this is a gas-filled x-ray tube. We don't use those anymore. But, oh, sorry. Um, but instead we're using x-ray x-ray sources like this, um, sort of vacuum tubes, which haven't really changed over time. Uh, they all work, they still work on the same principle where we have an electron stream that hits the anode and uh, by the breaking process in the anode, uh, we produce a lot of x-rays and we produce a lot of heat in the anode. Um, if you want to know more about this, I do have a lecture on x-ray generation in, um, in my YouTube list. So once we have that x-ray source, uh, we then monochromate the x-rays. So we pick out uh, x-rays of one particular wavelength. And we then send that through a collimator. And the collimator cuts down our X-ray beam to a size of about half a millimeter in, in diameter, or less than that. Um, after which, electron density differences in our sample will cause a small fraction of the X-rays to be scattered. Uh, we stop the, the unscattered beam using a beam stop so that it doesn't uh, overload our detector or dis disrupt our signal. And we collect the scattered radiation on the detector. And in practice, the experiment is really as simple as this. Uh, but as I mentioned, it is really hard to do this experiment right. But if you look at the instruments, you actually recognize many of those elements from the schematical description. So we have our X-ray sources over here. Um, in our instrument, we have two X-ray sources, uh, slightly different energies. Um, I will explain why later. We then send these X-rays through a collimation system, uh, which in our case consists of three sets of scatterless slits. It then enters our vacuum sample chamber. This is uh, uh, 
a very large chamber for instruments of this type. Um, we have 50 by 50 by 60 centimeters of space in there, uh, enough space for a very large experimental setups, so we can do in situ experiments. And after that, it hits uh, the hybrid pixel detector, which sits inside this big vacuum tank on a motorized stage. Um, this instrument, just to give you an idea of scale, this is what it looks like. Uh, actually, this is what it looked like in the beginning. This is when it was installed. It was still nice and shiny. Since then, we have modified a lot of things. Uh, we started out modifying the software, and we ended up modifying also the hardware. So it, um, uh, yesterday, I took this picture of our instrument. It looks a lot worse because all the all the beautiful paneling is gone and so on. Uh, but we've added a lot of hardware. We've made some changes um, to the uh, to the sample stage, for example, um, which has all led to a big improvement of the instrument. So while it looks worse, it is actually producing a lot better data now. So what are we doing? Well, we are sending these X-rays. Uh, through our sample and we're collecting the radiation uh, uh, scattered at the other end. And um, the structure that you're investigating, uh, the size of the structure that you're investigating is dependent on the angles that you're looking at. So if we look at angles between say 110 degrees, you're looking at objects uh, with a structural dimension between an angstrom and a nanometer. If you then look at smaller angles, uh, this size range shifts up. So if we're looking between 10 and 1 degree, uh, we're looking up to 10 nanometers. And if we're looking even uh, at further smaller angles uh, to about 0.1 degree, um, we can look at structures up to 100 nanometers. Um, historically, the instruments were limited to about one decade in, uh, in angular range. Uh, this was the first sax machine that I worked on. Uh, during a company internship, it was a sort of a tabletop sized instrument, uh, fixed in geometry, and yes, this measures uh, structures within one decade of size. And you then have to get lucky. You have to get lucky that the structure that you're interested in, in your sample, falls within this range. Um, things got a little bit better during my PhD. I worked on this instrument. Uh, this was a 13 meter long instrument at uh, DTU Rizzo in Denmark. And this one you could modify. You could manually take out segments of, uh, of, of, the, of this tubing, both at the end as well as in the collimation, um, so that you could start measuring at different angles. However, since this is a manual process, um, and since you needed to realign and uh, readjust everything after every time after you did this, we didn't really change it all that much. Because um, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. So most samples were still measured in one angular range. Same goes for this Rigaku instrument, and the same goes for this Bruker instrument. Um, I think I've never seen this Bruker instrument in any other configuration than this. When I returned to Germany, um, I Got I started working on this instrument again. This is basically the, the successor of the first instrument that I worked on. It was a little bit better, measured over a little bit wider range, but still very limited. Um, and then our instrument came, and you can see that this instrument measures over a very wide angular range. Um, and we do this for every sample. The, the reason we, we now measure over this range for every sample is because it's easy. We have a detector which sits in vacuum on a motorized stage, so we only have to program the machine to measure in a particular configuration. So for every sample, we measure um, at least uh, three or four different uh, uh, scattering patterns. So that means that uh, when we have our uh, uh, when we have our schematic description of our of our experiment. Um, that we measure each sample uh, first with a detector at uh, uh, very close to the sample. Actually, we can move this uh, much closer than this. We can move this about one centimeter from the sample. If we're not careful, we can actually move it into the sample. So it is a little bit risky to do this, but it has great benefits. So you measure close to the sample, and you can see scattering patterns like this. And you, you see these rings over here. These are diffraction rings, for those of you familiar with, uh, with X-ray diffraction. Um, 
And then we move the detector further out, and we're basically zooming in on the very central section of the first uh, scattering pattern. And we move it even further, collect another one of these scattering patterns, and that really focuses on the um, on the um, sort of very small, uh, very small angle scattering um, uh, processes that occur. Um, that means that we're looking at different size ranges, and by combining this information uh, into usually a single curve, uh, we get um, information over a very wide range, and that tells us a lot about the internal structure of our sample. Um, you see that we often go from two-dimensional uh, scattering images like this to one-dimensional curves. Um, we can do this in case this two-dimensional image is not oriented. So in case we don't have an oriented structure in our sample, which points with structures pointing all in one direction, um, if everything is randomly oriented, they scatter in all directions equally. And that means we can uh, do this um, azimuthal integration. Uh, which sort of looks like, uh, sort of looks like this. So the further out we go from the center of the scattering pattern, um, the more our intensity decays. But it doesn't really change. Um, uh, uh, it doesn't really change with the azimuthal angle uh, over here. The good thing about this is that the further out you go, the more pixels there are that cover this angular range. So um, while the intensity drops off very very fast. Um, the statistics don't deteriorate all that much because we've got more pixels to average over. All right. So, if you don't finish, uh, if, if you don't finish with collecting uh, this information, you might get a pattern like this. So, this is a scattering pattern from a ZIF8 from a metal organic framework that was measured by uh, that was synthesized and measured by uh, by my colleague Glenn Smills. Um, we measure this with two sources, a uh, molybdenum source and our copper source. Uh, these have slightly different ranges. Um, but we measure this in total over almost four decades in, uh, in size. So over here it's indicated as Q, but uh, Q is a, is a description of angle. Um, but this really represents uh, four decades uh, in size information. But what is actually scattering here? Well, I mentioned that we are scattering from, um, from the electron cloud around, around atoms. Um, and that means that if we have heavier atoms, uh, then we get more scattering from there. It's not exactly true. We are um, actually scattering from the differences in electron density contrast. Um, you can imagine what that looks like. Uh, in uh, for a sample of a particular electron density in uh, in different mediums, if we have a large difference in contrast, then things are very easy for us to see. But if you have a sample which is very close in contrast to that of the surrounding medium, things get much harder. Um, so, for example, things like uh, gold nanoparticles in water are super easy for us to detect at very low concentrations because it's a very high contrast. Um, but uh, for things like um, for things like silica spheres in water, we need some we need a higher concentration so that we can offset the difference in contrast. Um, and this is also why things like um, uh, polystyrene in water is uh, impossible for us to measure. So polystyrene has a density of 1.04 gravimetric, and water a density of uh, 0.998. So this is pretty much. This contrast is very, very, very small, and we have no chance uh, of measuring this in our uh, in our instrument. Um, with biological samples, it's often uh, it's a little bit dependent on what you're actually measuring, but the contrast there can be very low as well. So there, you need a relatively high concentration of uh, of proteins, for example, or or, or folded DNA fragments, uh, before you can actually detect a good enough that, uh, signal over your background. All right. Um, I mentioned a little bit about neutron scattering. So here is a visualization of the differences that we have um, between X-rays and neutrons. You see the contrasts are vastly different. And you can exploit this, um, this difference in contrast uh, 
uh, to highlight parts of your structure. I have an example about that later. Um, but that's the, the, main, the main difference, the main message to, to pick up between X-ray and neutron scattering is uh, the big difference in contrast between the elements. So um, let's go back to scattering. What is actually scattering? Well, it turns out that the intensity that we detect on our detector is related to the um, electron density contrast in our sample. Um, and the relationship with, with that is quite nice in that it is uh, related by a Fourier transform. So in essence, our instrument is a Fourier transformer for anything we stick into the beam. And I find that really, really cool. Um, and those of you familiar with Fourier transforms say, well, in that case, you can take your intensity and inverse Fourier transform it and get your three-dimensional electron density back. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Because we are not seeing the entire Fourier transform, we're only seeing the intensity component. So we've lost information, we've lost all the information on the phases. Now this is the same phase problem that you have in, uh, in X-ray diffraction, right? Uh, it's the uh, same principles uh, are, um, are going on behind this. Um, However, I realize that many of you are not familiar with Fourier transforms, so I have a small demonstration to hopefully, uh, to hopefully give you a little bit more insight in this. I didn't understand Fourier transforms until well into my PhD, um, but they can be super helpful. So let me start that demonstration. So you should be seeing this, this, this camera image from my second webcam over here. And next to it is a window. And this window is the intensity component of the Fourier transform of this image. So um, this, by the way, is the azimuthal integral of that, uh, of, of that Fourier transform. So this is what would happen if you would do this um, conversion from the two-dimensional Fourier transform to the one-dimensional Fourier transform. And now I can show you shapes. So I can show you what happens if I put, um, if I have spherical scatterers. You see we have these very nice oscillations uh, of these spherical scatterers uh, which show up as very uh, good features in our scattering pattern. As you now know, if I have a larger structure, these, uh, these features shift to smaller angles, so I need to move this pretty far away. Um, you get very high frequency oscillations over here. And if I have smaller objects, uh, these things move uh, to wider angles. Now, due to that information loss that we have, uh, we actually cannot tell the difference between a black sphere on a white background or a white sphere on a black background. Both scatter exactly the same. So this is why you need to input information um, to get information out. For elongated objects, you get uh, an elongated scattering pattern, and this rotates together with the object. And this, the only thing that makes sense in Fourier space is the rotations, because uh, they stay the same. Uh, so you can have things like cylinders or ellipsoids, and these all change together um, uh, with the object. Um, so the Fourier transform is really a, is really a frequency map of, of this object, you can see that, if I can center it, yeah, um, you can see that uh, where we have a very short distance, that uh, in the Fourier transform you get a very long spacing, and where we have a long distance, um, you get a very short spacing. Um, I have some other shapes uh, for you here. I have, uh, I have cubes, which, oops. Uh, no. Zoom is a little bit large on that. <laughs> um, so I have cubes for you, and uh, for Christmas I also have some stars, uh, which are quite nice in their Fourier transform. Um, however, we usually don't have one object in our scattering pattern, um, uh, in our structure. We usually have more. So if we have a concentrated system of particles, uh, we still see these nice oscillations uh, that can tell us something about a particle uh, shape. But if we have polydispersity in there, uh, we don't see this anymore because all of these oscillations from each individual object, they start overlapping. So our information now is, uh, is 
sort of convoluted um, with the size distribution. For oriented uh, polydispersed systems, you still get this orientation, still this anisotropy in your scattering pattern, but again, the oscillations are pretty much gone. Um, now, since I'm here, let me explain also X-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction is the same thing, but with a regular lattice over there. So you still have the form factor, as we saw before, uh, but now you have um, now you have this form factor convoluted with a lattice. Um, and the lattice comes from the regular spacing uh, in your system. And it doesn't just work for square lattices, it also works for hexagonal lattices. Um, and here you can very clearly see the Fourier transform of the, uh, of the object itself, of the spheres, and the, um, and the lattice from this hexagonal structure. So I hope that cleared things up a little bit uh, in terms of Fourier transforms. Uh, if you want to play around with this, the software is also available in that link that I showed you before. Um, so, uh, just to recap, the intensity is our Fourier transform uh, of our electron density map, but only the intensity component, uh, not the phase component. So, what can we do to analyze, to describe the electron density here? Or to get some information on our structure back? Oops. Um, well, there's one thing we can do. Since we know it's a Fourier transform, we can compare the measured intensity to a Fourier transform of a model structure. And by adjusting the, uh, the model parameters um, and systematically adjusting these model parameters, we can get a better and better match between the intensity of the one um, uh, between the model intensity and uh, the intensity from our data. Now, this comparison, of course, works the best uh, when, you tr when you bring the model and data as close together as possible. Um, you can do this by uh, adjusting your model for, or accounting in your model for reality. This means including things like uh, polydispersity in your model, um, and, um, uh, and maybe things like beam smearing. It also means that you have to correct your data. The thing that you collect in your scattering, pat uh, in your scattering instrument is, uh, is data, but that is data with a lot of uh, um, additional signals in it. Signals from your sample container, signals as uh, artifacts from the way that we measure. Um, so from all of these signals, you really need to extract just the scattering signal from, uh, from the analyte that you're interested in. So this needs to be corrected for imperfections. Once you've done this, uh, however, you can exploit this behavior. So let's go back to our, um, let's go back to our uh, ZIF A pattern. There's a couple more things that, uh, that I want to explain over here. So, these scattering patterns, they then contain information on uh, structures of different sizes. Um, but you see a lot of different features in this pattern. You see um, some peaks in this range, in the wide angle scattering range. Um, what are those about? Well, you might recognize these peaks. Um, they are from regular distances. Um, and many of you will be familiar with, uh, with X-ray diffraction. Um, where you characterize these regular, dis uh, regular distances. So, are these things the same? Why do we call it wide angle scattering instead of X-ray diffraction? Well, these things are pretty much the same, but there is one crucial difference. Um, the difference lies in, uh, in the difference at the, uh, on the axes. Um, with XRD, you typically measure things as uh, scattering or diffracting uh, diffraction to two theta, whereas we put things in a unit of Q. The big difference um, is that Q is independent of wavelength. That means that if you want to calculate your d-spacings, things get a lot easier. Uh, so to put that graphically, um, for X-ray diffraction, your angle two theta is uh, simply the angle between the between the diffracted beam and the beam that goes straight. Um, for Q, 
uh, we've normalized this by the uh, by the wavelength of the radiation that we use. Um, but why do we do this, right? It, it's not just to make this conversion to despacing easier. Um, it has additional benefits. And the benefits come when we measure um, samples with different energies. So this, uh, this ZIF-8 structure uh, was also measured with different energies, uh, two different sources, detector at the same distance. You see that the diffraction rings that were visible in, uh, in copper to fairly wide angles are now suddenly scrunched together and are much closer to the beam stop with our molybdenum uh, source. If you would look at this in XRD, the peaks would be in different places because, uh, the, um, because the angles in, uh, in 2 theta are different. Um, however, the peaks should be, uh, the, the peaks are still related to the same crystalline structure. So when we show this in Q, um, we actually see that all the peaks are in the same place. Now, I've seen this a couple of times, and I really recommend not to do this. I see that uh, some diffractionists take this molyb molybdenum signal and recalculate the two theta angles to two theta as if it were copper, um, and then pretend and analyze it as if uh, uh, just completely as if it were copper. And this isn't right for multiple reasons, uh, but the main reason is that these signals actually are not the same. Right? What you measure with molybdenum isn't necessarily the same as what you measure with copper. The crystalline lattice is the same, but you see there's a difference over here in the signal. The molybdenum signal is a lot higher uh, than the copper signal. Um, now, was this a mistake from our side? Did we not do our data corrections right? Um, no, this, the data corrections were done right. What we're seeing here is uh, that for molybdenum, we get the additional influence of fluorescence. And this is also a second reason why we have two sources, uh, is to deal with fluorescence. Uh, fluorescence is what happens if you have, um, if you have your atom with your, uh, with your um, uh, electronic levels. You shine at it with x-rays of a particular wavelength, you might kick out one of these core electrons. Uh, what happens then is that there's a there's a there's a um, uh, a gap a space for an electron and pretty much immediately you will get uh, electrons uh, falling back from higher uh, orbitals into that core orbital and when they do this they lose energy and this gets emitted in the in the um, by means of an X-ray photon which causes X-ray fluorescence which we can measure um, so this fluorescent signal is really something that comes from your sample. It tells you something about your sample as well. Uh, it, it at least tells you that you might be looking at the right sample if it contains these elements that would fluoresce. All right. How would you go about analyzing one of these scattering patterns? Um, if you look at scientific papers, you will often see a pattern, uh, you will often see equations like this. Now, this isn't 100% correct, but, it, you know, caveats with everything, but it is a relatively good way of describing uh, the different elements that play a role. So we describe our intensity as um, uh, in three components. Uh, one is the form factor, which tells us something about the shape of our particles. Second one is a structure factor, which tells us something about the packing of our samples. And the third one is the size distribution. Um, and this tells us, uh, well, this is the information on the size distribution of these shapes. And both the form factor and the structure factor are dependent on the size. In principle, the structure factor is also dependent on the size distribution, which is why this is an approximation. Um, you've seen the structure factor just now, the, you know, these regular distances that we have, uh, but they don't just appear at the wide angles. They can also appear at the small angles. Um, for example, for this alumina membrane that we measured with uh, pore spacings uh, between the pores in a hexagonal array of 120 nanometers. This means that at our longest distance, where we measure larger structures, we still see diffraction peaks and we can analyze these. Um, and they will give us uh, the peaks for a hexagonal structure spaced 120 nanometers apart. Um, so 
Well, what else can we see over here? Well, we see in the small angle, um, in a small angle region, we see this. This is not the fraction. These are not peaks. These are bumps. They are, they are different. <laughs> um, these bumps come from the form factor of our, uh, of our sample. The form factor is characteristic uh, of the shape of the object and uh, in lesser degree of the size. <clears throat> um, it's dependent on the size because uh, these form factors, I've shown here the form factor of a sphere with a background added, um, they shift to smaller angles the larger the structure gets. So if we have larger spheres, you'll get more scattering to smaller angles. Uh, but the interesting features um, over here, the, the characteristic feature of this size moves to smaller angles, and that's why you need to measure two smaller angles if you have larger structures. Um, it's also dependent on the shape of the particle, so you remember that this uh, scattering is the Fourier transform of the object. It's the, it's the, the, uh, the length, um, the pairwise length distribution map. And you can imagine with a sphere that, uh, that you very quickly end up at lengths which are, uh, which are outside of the object. But with cylinders, you can, you can have some lengths which uh, go on for a longer while. That's why cylinders look a little bit different. Um, and ellipsoids, depending on whether they're prolate or oblate, uh, can have much different scattering patterns as well. So that's why you need to input information from other techniques as well, because you can analyze the cylinder scattering patterns um, by assuming they're spheres. It's just wrong. Right, because it, the actual structure is a cylinder, not a sphere. So as soon as you know uh, that bit of information, then you, small angle scattering can tell you what size or size distribution they are. All right. So um, this section, how do we how do we start analyzing this? I, I won't go through the complete analysis here. I don't have uh, I don't have time for that really. Um, but normally, what we do if we see these oscillations is that we estimate the, uh, the approximate size of the object, which in this case is 35 nanometers. And then we can start describing this, for example, with a sphere. Um, if we describe this with a sphere, it looks similar. Well, the bumps are in approximately the right place, but these dips are not there. Um, and the reason they're not there is because of polydispersity. So once we start adding size distributions, these, uh, these features, they really start disappearing. Um, and it's when we hit uh, size distributions of 15%, uh, so standard deviations of 15%, uh, that uh, we start getting uh, a dampening, which, is, which sort of approximate this structure. Um, so that way we can we can start getting closer and closer to describing our measured signal. So how do we actually fit this data? Well, I can't complete this story because uh, this is to analyze a scattering pattern like this. It would take uh, several weeks, if not months. It turns out these ZIF particles are not quite spheres, so you can't describe them with spheres. Um, they're sort of more like dodecahedrons. Um, and uh, therefore, you need much more advanced models to actually to actually describe this. But in principle, it's it's possible. All right. In the in this section, I have missed a lot of things. As I said, I can't unfortunately cover everything. I've missed backgrounds. Backgrounds are super important. So important that you take the right the right background for your measurement, so that you can extract the scattering signal of the objects you're interested interested in. We've missed things like smearing and broadening, uh, orientation, which I like, uh, different types of fitting, um, things like absolute intensity calibration, which gives you volume fractions and um, uh, uh, um, which can give you volume fractions of your scatterers, and many, many more things. Um, before I go, though, I'd like to spend five minutes um, uh, explaining what we do around the measurement. So. You know that we support, um, that, that I'm fairly materials agnostic. I don't care what goes into the instrument as long as it's interesting. Um, so we've measured 
over the last three years, a very wide range of materials, uh, including, uh, including biological materials. Now, normally we tend to stay away from biological materials for reasons of contrast, but also because for some reason the biological community and the material science community um, both are doing X-ray scattering, but they don't really in, um, interact all that much. I think it's unfortunate. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from each other, um, but that is the way it is. We've measured a lot of composite materials. I like them because they're, uh, they are one of the reasons I need my good data corrections. Um, we've measured geological materials like uh, gypsum, struvite, um, uh, calcium carbonate. We measured uh, metal organic frameworks, carbon organic frameworks, uh, resins, rubbers, nanoparticles in food, in solution, metal oxides, um, things like stainless steels and aluminium alloys. Um, so basically you can stick anything in that machine that you want. And we really rely on good collaborations here. Uh, last year we um, had 30% external users. We measured with our instrument, or we exposed the detector for 187 days, uh, sorry, 178 days, um, which is pretty much half a year of pure exposure. Um, and we get a lot of, um, uh, we, we're starting to see a lot of very nice publications come out of that. So I'm very, very happy with these results. Um, so how do we guarantee quality for this? Uh, well, that really comes down to everything you build up around the instrument. Now, it's easy to buy an instrument, but to you, you need to organize yourself around it so that, so that you can support all of these samples. Um, and we started doing that basically in the wrong way around, right? So I started developing analysis methods, uh, starting with uh, Monte Carlo methods. Um, which were quite nice. We had some nice publications about that. But these Monte Carlo methods, they allow you to analyze um, any kind of data. If you put good data into it, you will get very good results. If you put insufficiently corrected data into it, uh, garbage data, and you get garbage out. In, but the fit is still perfect. There's nothing that shows in fit that, that, that your data is wrong. So then you need to make sure that the data that goes into it is absolutely correct. So that was another few year, a few years of my life um, where I published a list of possible data corrections that you could do, um, extended that list uh, together with our colleagues, uh, Andrew Smith and Tim Snow, um, and they also implemented the data corrections. Now, there's a fairly extensive set of data corrections that you can do. Um, however, most of these data corrections are super easy, and we've implemented them in a piece of software, um, which is open source, and you can have all of these uh, all of these correction steps in a, uh, in a in a processing list, and you can then automatically process all your data. So we do the automated processing; we don't need to think about it anymore. And this is uh, implemented both at our instrument, the mouse, uh, as well at Diamond, as well as at Diamond's uh, i22 beamline. Um, so we've run hundreds and hundreds of samples through this data correction uh, method, and it works universally. Uh, for that to work, we need to put our data in, in a data file format, which is compatible uh, and which carries with it all the metadata that you need for your data corrections. And that doesn't really come uh, by itself. That needs a good instrument. That's why we commissioned this instrument uh, and we modified it so much so that we get all the extra information. We get the, uh, the transmission factors, uh, we get the beam fluxes, we get the beam profiles. Um, so we, we, uh, you have to take care that you get all the metadata so that the data corrections can do their job. Um, that is also not all. Then you need a good methodology. And this is what we're working on at the moment. Uh, we've submitted a paper on this. Um, it's a methodology that really is an integral, um, integral procedure where people fill in sample and proposal sheets. Uh, we then fill, it in, uh, fill in the measurement details in an electronic logbook. This gets converted to measurement scripts. Then the measurement is done. Um, and the measurement scripts takes care that all the uh, necessary metadata is collected. We collect the files, we convert the files, and then we can put uh, this into our data correction software, and only then we can start analyzing things. Now, all of this is automated, except for the analysis part, 
And we're now storing all of this information in a data catalog. Uh, this is SciCat. We copied this from the European Spallation Source. Uh, it's their open source project, and that allows us to organize our measurements and find, find our measurements. We can link them to the different proposals, the different samples. Um, that would never have worked without good people, so a big shout out to my colleague Glenn Smales, who together uh, with me worked on, uh, on setting this all up. And all of this would never have worked without very good collaborations, so uh, we're always happy to get people coming to us uh, who want to put in some small angle scattering detail in their, um, in their samples. Uh, we want to get some small angle scattering detail from their samples. So that's, uh, that's me opening up the floor for questions. Uh, thanks very much to everyone who's been very helpful during uh, the course of my career. I probably missed out a lot of different people um, on this list. I try to list everyone, but there is many more people who deserve to be on this list um, uh, who, I, who I haven't had the chance to add to this list yet. Um, so yes, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions.